Okay, just give me a minute, minute here to shift gears from my class I just taught, which was on reconstruction, to shift gears about the world at war. And let me also get into your um, discussion agenda for today. One thing, one bad thing about having having classes back to back is that the second class, that is your class, always suffers from this last minute farting around. All right, before we start that, any questions about the class in general, life, nature of the universe? No? Okay. Well, I hope you were able to you know, barely reading, hardly any reading at all, only five pages, but a lot of sort of facts were crammed into that. And I especially hope that you were able to listen to Professor Nash talk about why World War II was so bad on the podcast. Uh, I know it sounds kind of odd that for a module where we're trying to talk about the beginning of the war and how the war started and where the war started that I sort of also dumped on you this podcast about what you know what's the end result of the whole war but uh, the reason I did that was because of course Nash talks about the global aspects of the war and I think that's important it's I mean, important that's really crucial for us to continue to remember um, the effect that it had on on so many different places in the world. So uh, if there are no general farting around questions, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, fortunately, Gustav uh, Stoller and Gustafsson talk about the war uh, before the US involvement. And they give an actually really good summary of, I think, what, what happens before December, 19, December 7, 1941. But, um, Let's start off. Well, question one, according to Stoller and Gustafsson, the several possible dates, events that can mark the start of World War II, what, what are they? I, I sort of summarized my question there. What are those dates and stuff? Hunter, just, ju just jump right in. If you raise a hand, I can't see all of you on the screen at the same time. So unfortunately, the hand raising thing on the, the little icon doesn't work for me because I can't tell. Already, that, that's fine. Yeah, so um, just uh, what I find is that people can just jump in and start talking, and we we don't generally don't have problems with it. Uh, the first possible starting date was September 1939. Uh, yeah, the opening days of the month Germany invaded Poland. Then France and Great Britain responded with formal declarations of war. Okay, what are some other dates? That's 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 pretty late as far as. Uh, most people think. What are some other dates? He said uh, 1931 when the Japanese army conquered uh, northern China and established the puppet state. Yeah, sorry, I'm going to take out my headphones here for one second. Yes, that's uh, that's uh, that's very true. Keep keep going. I just have to stop the video for a second while I <clears throat> while I readjust my seat. Keep talking, Zach. And, and then I had after that was uh, 33 when Hitler came into power with the, the goal to dominate Europe and um, when he violated the Versa Versailles Treaty in 37. Okay, Cole, go ahead. Um, um, 19, what is it, 1937, whenever Japan invades China and starts the Sino-Japanese War. That's 37, right? Huh. So the law, what about the Spanish Civil War? Why would we consider that part of World War II? The Spanish Civil War is 1935. Is it because there was only really um, like the, the fascist and the, like only the Soviet Union and the Nazi Germany had like vested interests in that? conflicts like great britain and france didn't intervene not governmentally no I, and and you're, you're hitting on the right point there what happens is of course that germany and nazi germany and fascist italy 
support the uh, the rebels in the Spanish Civil War, and they kind of use it as an as a testing ground to try out new airplanes and try new weapons and stuff that they will, of course, then later use in the main war. Yeah, Brooke, go ahead. Yeah, no, that that's, that's just, yeah, because, um, I mean, there was no, uh, like you said, that Italy and the uh, Germany, of course, were allied and they supplied the, um, I think the German Air Force aided, like, yeah. in bombing the the uh um communist forces in in the civil in this spanish civil war so it was a direct it was like direct intervention on their part but the soviets didn't send troops there to participate di directly it was just their military aid i think they were giving to the uh communists to the republican, to yeah. republican government of spain yeah uh yes that's absolutely true so but so uh In one way, we can say, look, that all kinds of craps happening in the 30s, all kinds of different places are going to war. Is it all seems sort of inevitable that it would get much worse than that we would end up with September 1939 as the date for the, the sort of really big powers going to starting to go to war? I mean, first of all, nothing is inevitable, but is is there, is there so much going on that there's a possibility that that there that, that is highly likely by 1938 that Europe will be engulfed in a war at least as big as the Japanese encourage uh, incursions in China? I would think so, just because Adolf, you know, had his vision and he was determined to you know make it a reality and. That no matter no matter what, unless there was intervention of some sort or a defeat on his end, that it would have kind of ended up the way it did. All right, number two. Why were the Axis powers able to gain so much power in the 1930s? Um, I I would say I mean from the readings that you know Germany, Italy, and Japan were. Uh, pretty unsatisfied with the outcome of the uh, Treaty of Versailles. Uh -huh. And with this kind of broader sense of uh, like a mutual consensus between these nations that um, almost built a sense of unity because they were all upset about the same thing. So mm -hmm. within their own, I guess, domestically and, you know, I guess with them being foreign allies, eventually, I think it was, like you said, inevitable, but... You know. I also think England and France just didn't think that it would progress to the point that it did. I mean, they had known trench warfare to the point that, you know, everyone was, I read ahead, sorry. So I'm trying to remember <laughs> what was in this part. Just, just, yeah. I know. So I'm trying to remember what was in this part, but I mean, there really was this idea that like, we can't do that again. And then it was a completely different war by the time World War II got going. Okay, I don't think we can emphasize this enough. There, there's what, what Katie said. There's the overwhelming public opinion, government opinion, chattering classes opinion, everybody thought that we cannot have, cannot have another war like World War I. And uh, Europeans thought that World War I was brought out through a failure of diplomacy, a failure of all kinds of stuff. Um, but um, it, it, so in other words, it's, it's, it should be more understandable. It should be easy for us to understand why there are so many attempts at preventing uh, a war, so many times that Hitler, people cave into Hitler hoping that, well, he'll just take the Austria onslaught wasn't a big deal. They're all German anyway. And well, okay, some of his Czechoslovakian demands we sort of understand, you know, okay, okay, good. You know, they don't really draw the line until Poland. And um, but that but that's you can kind of understand that because so because World War One had been so bad, and what was the worst war up until that, up until that point. 
And so, sorry, my screen is frozen here. Why? Uh, and, and by the way, the Japanese were able to gain more power in in the Pacific because they're the they're the, the major industrialized power there, and uh, they're able to dominate other parts of the, uh, of the of Asia so easily. Why did the United States stay out of these conflicts in the 1930s, of the 1930s? Cole, you're doing the hand raising thing again, just jump in. Uh, oh, okay, sorry. Um, I think it was just because that we had just this long culture of generally not wanting to get involved in European affairs, um, but it was also just because of the destruction caused by World War One, they just go like, oh, we did it once. It was just a one time thing. I don't want to do this again. And they just were put off entirely until they were finally attacked by the Japanese at Pearl Harbor, that they were just kind of like, all right, we need to, the entire American public were just like, all right, yeah, we need to go to war. Okay. What else? I feel like Americans just, they just didn't want to get involved because it was overseas and there's the, the whole ocean, you know? So I didn't, they didn't want to really get involved because they didn't see the need to immediately. Yeah, yeah. And that then that answers the second part of the question, specifically what geographic feature was seen as a buffer for lots of Americans. And that's of course the Atlantic Ocean and, and, and the Pacific Ocean. Um, I want to, I want to stress, however, that for decades and decades and decades, the isolationist view of what was going on in Europe and in Japan and Indo in Indochina and in China was always denigrated by, by subsequent historians, by the popular press and all kinds of other stuff because that seen, it was just appeasing to Hitler and appeasing to Tojo and, and all that kind of stuff. And isolationists were always... When I was your age, when I was in college, isolationists were painted with this broad brush that say, oh, they're all, um, uh, they don't care about uh, other countries. They're all, um, th they just care about the United States, America firsters, doesn't matter what's going on. In other and that, that to a certain extent is true, but in the, in the intervening decades, and this shows you how important it is to keep studying history, between the time when I was in college and the time when you were in college, you're in college, Lots of experts have gone back and studied isolationism and found that it was much more diverse than we thought before. Sure, there are a bunch of hardliners like Charles Lindbergh who, and, and the America First Committee and people like that. But there were an awful lot of other people in the, uh, in fact, maybe the majority of the isolationists were saying, what, this again? You know, we, you know, the, Europe, you, the one thing about European history, and this is, I think all historians agree with this, the one thing that Europeans do so well is kill each other. <laughs> the Germans and the French in particular are fighting, at, are at war with each other from uh, 19, uh, from all the way back to Charlemagne. Okay. Every two generations, the French, the Franks and the, and the Angles or the French and the Germans, whatever it happens to be, they always end up uh, fighting each other. And so they did it. This, that's what starts World War II, kind and World War I, kind of those are the two biggest powers. And now they're doing it. Now they're doing it again. Europe just cannot get along. And why should the United States get involved in something that's going to be just the same as World War I and it's never going to change? So what I'm trying to say is the isolationist element in American politics at the time is sort of given more, I don't know, not, maybe not sympathetic listening to synthetic attention now than it ever did before but we know a lot more about it now than we ever did before so it's not completely on most people most historians now don't think that the isolation isolationism as a whole was completely unreasonable or that isolationists were just anti-foreign and stuck their head put their head in the sand and that that kind of stuff okay so in other words it's not Isolationism is not a totally is not considered now to be a totally ridiculous stance. 
the extremes of isolationism, the Charles Lindbergh's, the American Firsters, that is seen as a, as a, um, as, as uh, racially based and all kinds of other things. All right. What about these developments of 1940 and 1941? This is before Pearl Harbor. How did this change the American government's approach to the to the world war? And how did did a, did American public opinion change? Now again, this is before Pearl Harbor. So what's going on? What did Gustafsson and Stoller say was going on in U.S. Japanese relations in 39, 40, 41? Katie, you look like you're on the verge of answering this question. Um, I am. I'm trying to find. There was one line that I was trying to find in this. So if somebody else has the answer, they can go, and I'll keep looking for this. Um, because I, there was one line that stuck out to me, but again, it's on my computer, so I don't make some crazy. Okay. Well, somebody else. What was going? I mean, was the United was everything hunky dory between the United States and Japan until December seventh? Just no. all boom. It was like the United States was trying to squeeze um, unfavorably to the Japanese uh, when it comes to like raw materials and whatnot. And we were also assisting with like the Lend-Lease Act with Britain trying to bolster them up at the same time. And that obviously caused tensions. And then uh, it got to the point where uh, we completely shut off the Chinese uh, for raw materials. And um, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, the, throughout this whole period, the American reaction to European uh, developments is to support the Lend-Lease Act and support various ways of getting arms to the British without directly being involved in the war. The American reaction to Japanese militarism in the Pacific is to do similar things, but to say not similar things, but sort of informally helping the Chinese but also, as, as Zach rightly points out, gradually cutting off uh, a lot of raw materials that Japan need, especially oil and especially rubber. Um, this is, these, are, these are the two most important things in a war. Uh, well, I suppose steel is the third one. Uh, so so there, is, there is a long deterioration, deterioration of American-Japanese relations before Pearl Harbor uh, breaks out and Pearl Harbor Pearl Harbor was a surprise but an attack on American interests wasn't a surprise everyone expected it to come up to happen in the Philippines it turns out attack was on Pearl Harbor so um uh the sneak attack part of it was the Pearl Harbor part uh, most people in the know wouldn't have been surprised in fact most people in the know were expecting the Japanese to attack the Philippines American bases in the Philippines. Uh, Katie, did you find what you wanted? Uh, I did, but it was about this. It was about the breaking of the diplomatic code um, and what that meant, but you just talked about that. I want you to talk about it. I like the way you talk about it. Okay, well, just, I mean, essentially what you said that we knew something was coming because the Japanese, the, the diplomatic code had been broken. So we, there was a preparation for something which if I remember correctly is why there were so many people staged at Pearl Harbor, right? Because they were expecting to have to go further out. Yes. And that, that's why what happened at Pearl Harbor was so devastating was because we were, had essentially the entire Western fleet parked there waiting to go out. Right. Yeah. Waiting to go to the Philippines. To the Philippines. In case of a right. Philippine attack on the Philippines. Yeah. Yeah. So what happens to American public opinion then? Uh, uh, well, we've sort of question five is explain why relations with Japan deteriorate to the point of the attack on Pearl Harbor. Well, we've kind of e explained that, but American public opinion more or less shifts on a dime after on December 8th. Yeah. Okay. Now, one of the things I like about, one of the many things I like about these, these major problems books is that, uh, for instance, as I say in question six, Stoller and um, Gustafsson 
pose a number of questions here at the bottom of page four and top of page five. Um, what are these questions and how do they show us the complications that lead up to the up to war for the US of A? I kind of said with the first one being, was Nazi Germany a threat to the United States? I, I basically said like the real question is when will they be a true threat to the United States? Mm -hmm. and how strong would they be at that point? It's kind of how I see it. I don't know if that's completely accurate, but. Yeah, I remember a lot of things have to happen in order for Nazi Germany to become an actual threat to the United States. In the first place, they would have had to have defeated Britain, right? Because the British Navy is the largest Navy in the world. Yada, yada, yada. Uh, if that had happened, Hitler might have said, well, that's fine. I'm done. Um, he might have not wanted to launch a whole uh, transatlantic assault. That's, it's very controversial how much, how many plans, how much Pit Hitler had plans for an attack uh, on, on the United States. And of course, because it's so far away, most people don't think that the Nazis are going to attack the United States. After all, did the German government launch an attack on the United States in 1917 after the United States entered World War I? No. Okay. That's a whole nother order of magnitude crossing the, crossing the Atlantic Ocean. Okay. What else? Should Roosevelt, the next one is, should Roosevelt and, hang on, uh, I have my Outlook mail open from campus because I want to see if we get a notification oh, about in-person instruction on Tuesday. Oh, we did. Um, return to in-person instruction from Professor Gregson. Gregerson. Yes, I guess we are still going back on Tuesday. All right. Well, that seems to be unless something happens tonight or tomorrow. Seems like we're we're going in. I will see you all on Tuesday, as normal. Okay, that's why I wanted to have the mail the mail open, and that's why you hear that ping just in case something somebody did say something and we had to rejig the course. Anyway, should Roosevelt and the United States have acted earlier and more forcefully against Hitler? And in, uh, and in support of the nations he attacked, or perhaps less forcefully. What do you think about that? I think that goes back to saying how there was a lot of things that needed to happen in order for like Hitler to become an actual threat to the US like at that time. But I think that if the US would have acted more forcefully in support of the nations that he attacked, maybe, maybe like um, Hitler would have become more of a threat to the US, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly if let's just say for the sake of argument, Roosevelt wasn't able to get the Congress to agree to land lease. Well, a lot of material uh, wouldn't have gone to Britain. An awful lot of material wouldn't have gone to Britain. And that might have changed everything completely. I, you know, these are one of the things we can, we can never know for sure. So it is possible that if the United States had remained absolutely strictly isolationist, an attack from Germany might have happened. I don't think so, but you know, uh, there are people who do who do think so. There are experts who do think so. Um, what what do you think about this? Uh, we have all these other questions, but uh, the, but. Um, what do you think about this one where he says, um, um, where they say, did he, that is FDR, manipulate a backdoor to war as critics charge? And we will take this up again when, when we take up the, the, the War with Japan week module. Do you think, do you think of it as, as lend lease and other things and, and, and Diplomatic wrangling and economic wrangling with the Japanese as a kind of a backdoor way to war, an informal war or non-declared war. Zach, you're shaking your head. Yeah, I was going to say no, really. I mean, I didn't know about Lend-Lease until 
you know, a couple of days ago, uh, which makes sense. We still have that 99 year lease and, you know, I got friends in Lake and Heath and whatnot. I mean, it was a great strategic um, thing for the United States to be able to have uh, more installations on that side of the Atlantic. And, um, you know, I guess like the support of a moral cause and again, the argument of the United States always getting in, involved with other people's affairs because of the way it could domino affect us. But um, I don't, I don't think so really. I mean, I think he led the public opinion to go to the question two before that or one before that, uh, because he quickly garnered support, but even before Pearl Harbor, the people are starting to lean towards him. Yeah. Because he says, doesn't he, in one of his first addresses, if my neighbor's house is on fire, I'm going to lend him my hose. I'm not going to say, you know, because I, I, if I lend him my hose, then he'll put his house out fire and it won't, my house won't catch fire. So that's the, that's the justification uh, for lend lease. So whether, we're, whether that's backdoor or not is, is sort of an open question. What I think is not in doubt among historians is there used to be this charge, especially among left, left and uh, socialist and proto-communist people in Europe and in the United States that the United States entered the war and entered World War I because American companies, American bankers especially, had more invested in the allied countries, Britain and France, than they did in Germany, Germany and Austria. In other words, that, that the United States goes into war because it, it's got to make sure that it's, it's investment that the, you got to make sure the allies win so that they're not bankrupt and they can, we can continue doing business with them. Now that's not, that's not true. And that it's an exaggeration. Most historians now believe that, that the United States went into the war for a cluster of reasons, only one of which, and only a minor one of which was, was, was that one. But there's, there are always these attempts at kind of conspiracy theories of, Oh, well, it's because the greedy capitalists only got, you know, wanted to get this, wanted to get that. Or uh, Roosevelt was an Anglophile and he was desperate to help Churchill. And, and Ro Churchill was Roosevelt's best friend and they would buddy up together and blah, blah. And none, none of that stuff is, is true. Okay. What, what gets the United States into the war is Pearl Harbor. Um, so it, it is, I think this backdoor thing has always been a problem. And if anything, Roosevelt would have loved it if Lend Lease had worked completely and kept the United States out of the European War, and if, um, if for whatever reason Pearl Harbor hadn't been attacked. So the the, the idea that he want that he was coming up with ways to get us in the war is is just uh, a historical. Okay. But it's incredibly complicated, as all of you have said something, have pointed out. It's incredibly complicated what uh, what uh, what happened and what what why the United States eventually becomes involved in the war. Okay, uh, today I didn't expect today's discussion to go on very long because I just wanted to make sure we had this global view in mind before we started talking about things on Tuesday. How many of you were able to listen to why was World War II so devastating podcast? I did. Okay. I did. Oh, good. Gosh, that's a lot of you. Okay. Uh, actually, I can't remember. Yeah, why was World War II so bad? Um, wow. Hands are going up. Okay, good. Well, uh, th th that's one of the things that we like to stress in, in modern history is that, you know, we, we forget about how awful World War II was because we, because literally you don't know a lot about it. So let me ask you some of these questions that, uh, how does Professor Nash in that podcast describe the global aspect of World War II? Oh, someone, sorry, someone's approaching something in the chat. Sorry, I should have looked at that. Oh, I did, Ali. Okay, I did. He said it was, uh, you know, where large populated countries and empires that were fully mobilized for war to a greater extent than World War I, uh, with the advancements of technology for the armies, navies, and air force um with firepower tanks and bombs and fighting fighting for a very long time and um being fought ruthlessly uh from totalitarian and military governments 
Yeah, you can't say, you can't argue that the German government in 1914 is totalitarian. Uh, you can't say that the Austrian government is totalitarian. Uh, you know, th these, are, these are fundamentally different circumstances the United States is presented with and all, and all the allies are presented with. It, uh, it's almost as if, especially in the Pacific and in, in Asia, it's almost as if Japanese power gets to a certain point where the Japanese government feels we have to use this power. You know, we have we we have we're now the dominant power in Asia because we were smart enough, or whatever, to convince themselves to industrialize the way we did, and all that stuff. So we all we wanted to get hold of those rich resources in in China, and in Indochina. By the way, where there's a lot of rubber, um, I don't know if any of you are engineering or military history or resource nerds, but. The invention of synthetic rubber was one of the <laughs> most amazing changes in, in world history. Um, what was I saying? Uh, so it's almost as if Japan was, go, was bound, to, bound to start throwing its weight around in Asia. Um, anyway, and that wouldn't have happened if Japan hadn't worked itself up into a, a military, militaristic dictatorship. Do you think maybe, I, he doesn't discuss this in the podcast, but do you think maybe while all this was going on, what else is going on in the 1930s while all this other stuff was going on in America? What else is going on in the United States in the 1930s? Um, the Great Depression started. Right. Are people going to give a rat's ass about Jap Japanese incursions into Manchuria when they're out of work and when they're on their bread lines and things like that. Sorry, I probably shouldn't have said that phrase there, but you know what I mean? Turn me in if you, if you want to, um, by the way, if I ever do swear, turn me in because I'm trying to clean up my act. Um, yeah, that, that, that's another thing to, to remember. Uh, but, but let's get back to these numbers. Uh, let's get back to this thing about uh, the, the war and why it was so bad. As I say in this question too, Professor Nash gives a lot of numbers in that interview and uh, to a shocking amount. How does the discussion, uh, it says, should say, how does discussion handle the question? Oh, how does the discussion handle the question of the numbers of civilians who died from war deaths in relation to direct deaths from military action? I was quite surprised. I didn't know it was this number, you know, 35 million allied civilians of the 60 million that died. Um, my dad's a big history buff and he didn't think it was that much either. Actually, when I was talking to him about it last night. Um, yeah, it was just crazy how lopsided it was really uh, and how it flips for the military dead though. So. Yeah, it is, it is, it is just, it's just astounding, right? What else would I, I mean, I hate to be too number centric, but I think that uh, uh, it's important to know these numbers. How many of you wrote down some of them, the uh, more extreme numbers? Um, I remember him saying that 60 million dead, he thought was the low estimate and that yeah. it could be as high as 80 million. I didn't know it was that high. Yeah. Now think about that. You know, that's just a, just a shockingly large number. You need you need dozens of World War Ones in order for that to happen. Okay. Where are there these civilian losses of life, and where are they so uh, extensive? Um, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Somebody. No, go ahead, man. Oh, I was just going to say that. Um, Two thirds of the Allied civilian losses were from Soviet and Chinese civilians, which I thought was, I mean, me personally, I thought was pretty, uh, pretty astounding. Uh -huh. Yeah, the Chinese died, died of starvation, all kinds of other stuff. Uh, yeah, I thought that was really interesting later when they went into um, a little bit about like the Bengal famine and uh, the famine in there in um, Vietnam. I thought that was really interesting. 
yeah, 2.1, 3.1 million people die in the fam famine in Megal, partly caused by Japanese... Uh, um, the rice, right? Uh, yeah, the, and also by, um, by the British not then ship, but by continuing to ship export food from India, right? One to two million Vietnamese died in 1945. Uh, famine. The Soviet Union is so devastated agriculturally that a million people die after the war in a famine, uh, in starvation, 45 to 47. Uh, how else do civilians die in World War II that they, in ways that they didn't die in great numbers in World War I? I was going to note that... Uh... The, the stat that really got me was about the Doolittle Raid and how the Japanese yeah. estimated 250,000 Chinese for, you know, assisting in, you know, uh, American pilots during that alone, which contributed, you know, a decent number to the 15 million that were killed by the Japanese. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is amazing. And by the way, and all the all the strategy people, all the military people are 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 working through these things are saying, okay, if we have these do little raids, there are going to be reprisals. Even if we try to crack down on them, they're going to be able so there's this weighing of the do little raids important enough that we're willing to give up however many people the Japanese are going to kill in revenge. Well, what's the, what's the specific sort of military uh, development that ends up killing more civilians than probably anything else. I think maybe, um, I'm just thinking of like Stalingrad specifically, um, like air raids. I don't think yeah. there's as many air raids in World War I as World War II, for sure. Yeah, there were air raids at a very small scale. Yeah. It, they didn't have like long range, high altitude bombers. Right. Before. Fire bombs. Yeah. For Japan. Firebombing of Japan, firebombing of Tokyo, especially. I have some uh, stats here, Nash stats, uh, strategic bombing of 400,000 Germans and 500,000 uh, um, Japanese civilians die from, from strategic bombings. So I don't know how many, um, I don't know how many people die in uh, bombings of Britain, but um, you know, and he says that more civilians die in one bombing raid in lots of instances in World War II than in, you know, the whole Franco-Prussian War in 1870, 1871. So it is really a huge technological change and strategic change and mil military change. It really is, uh, it really is uh, shocking. We all, we all know about the Battle of Britain. We all know about the Blitz. We all watch movies where London's being bombed and all that stuff. And it's all terrible and immoral and wrong and everything. But we don't ever walk, we don't know, and we don't ever know anything about the civilians in Germany who were uh, killed by allied raids. Okay? Germany was by far the most devastated country in Europe um, uh, because of bombing. Now let's get on to military laws. What was my last question in this section? Oh yeah, okay, so this is still question one. What about the military deaths? And he doesn't give us raw numbers so much as sort of percentage of who, of who, uh, of the total military deaths and the allies and the Axis, who, who suffers the most? I have a app, <clears throat> allied 25% uh, were the military losses and Axis 75. And uh, both Germany and Soviet uh, on the respective sides lost 65% or that account for 5% of the military deaths alone. Yeah. Shocking. Shocking. Yeah. Especially when you consider 65% of all allied, allied deaths were Soviet. 2% of all allied deaths were British. 2%. Uh, and in the United States is, is the same way. The more you, the more the percentage of overall allied de overall allied deaths is higher for Yugoslavia than it is for the United States, or for uh, or for the United Kingdom. China is twenty three percent. I mean, these are just these are just shockingly high numbers. 
right? And finally, what, why does, well, we've already sort of said this, why it happens because weapons are more destructive. Uh, uh, but also Nash makes the argument that two countries in particular were very prolific with lives, very willing to throw bodies at the problem. Who are these two countries? Japan and Russia. Yeah. It really was shocking how dehumanizing it had dehumanized it was you know we're, we're willing to throw millions of bodies at the, at the problem especially soviet unions willing to willing to put up with 20 million war dead in order to stop the german the german advance and there's also there's a, finally there's one thing that nash says that i think is interesting that we hardly never well, we hardly ever take into account when when talking about deaths and why people die, I mean that was fighting conditions. What, what about the the conditions of battle that made it so bad? Yeah, I mean, uh, fighting in the remote tropical rainforest. I thought it was fascinating that two thirds of the Japanese that did die were is from starvation and disease, you know, yeah. and bad conditions. I never would have thought that it'd be that much just in relation to even current wars or Vietnam even, et cetera. I mean, they were mainly combat deaths, not fighting condition deaths. So it was yeah. quite surprising. Yeah, it is, it, it, it is shocking. And, and, and when we think, when we, we, uh, when we talk about the, the Pacific theater for the United States, we're gonna talk, one of the things we're gonna come to discuss is how awful it, how awful it was. You know, jungle diseases, foot rot, trench, all, all kinds of things are happening to a much greater degree in the Pacific than they are in the European theater. Huh? Uh, the people who are suffering from fighting conditions in the, in the European theater are the Soviets and, and the German soldiers on, on the Eastern Front who are dying, perishing from, from the cold. But the, the climate extremes in, in the Pacific were something, of course, that no one was really, no one on the Allied side was really prepared, prepared for it was just uh, was just uh, awful. So one one of the reasons I wanted you to listen to this podcast was after he goes through all this stuff, right? You can understand that uh, it's all it's all bad and disheartening. Like I said, but you can understand now why World War II is so bad. Almost everything is pointing towards massive death numbers, right? technology, extreme weather conditions, bombing, blah, 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 blah. It's almost as if it couldn't help but be as bad as it was. Am I being too negative there? Katie, you're about to say something I can see. No, I, I think you're not being too negative. I think overall, I mean, every aspect of World War II was something that people were not prepared for from fighting like the, the combat con conditions to dropping an atom bomb. I mean, none of those things were yeah. precedented. We were not prepared. Even, even the Axis was not prepared for the things that occurred in this war. So no, I don't think you're being too negative. I don't want to sound like it was out of everybody's hands, but it's almost as if once, once these destructive forces are unleashed, it was, uh, it was, uh, uh it, 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 you know the people weren't willing to try to stop them before it got worse now but of course remember th these are very serious problems there's a war going on they're trying to uh, you know win a war the, the 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 military especially in governments are not going to be able to stop and say well you know we should be more careful with what we're doing because after all they believe the other side is going to do it to them first that's why I, I, you know, uh, no wars are good, but World War II is especially, especially tragic. All right. Any other, any other questions? Did you like having a podcast to listen to as part of the thing? Okay. Connor did. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there in terms of what we're going to talk about today. And then I'll, because you were so good at, uh, at chiming in today, 
I'm not going to assign groups of people different questions like I usually do. What happens is if the discussions are, are kind of lame, I'll start assigning questions to people to, to, to make them talk. Uh, but this one, this was okay. So on uh, the discussion agendas I put out, I'll put up there tonight for Tuesday and Thursday will be open-ended. They won't have, you know, won't have lists of 10 people have to take this question, 10 people have to take that question. Okay, and let's just cross our fingers that, uh, that uh, I'll see you on Tuesday. Okay. Have a good one. All right, adios. Yeah. Take care. Thank you.